Well, I think what I want to do is just really go into this, the meat of this subject. Most people uh, don't really have problems in handling the issues of life when everything's good. Uh, when it's sweetness, you know, when your health is good, uh, most people are very happy. They're not really concerned about, you know, asking questions. They just like things to remain as they are. And then everything changes. We have a problem. Our health is maybe not so good or something, somebody else in our family is a problem there or our storyline just seems to go, as sometimes we talk about, goes south and things are not so good. Uh, usually we're not conscious or systematic about our analysis of life when things like that happen. We, we just don't really want to be there and we just want to get out of there as quickly as we possibly can. Just get me back to the main road. It's like a diversion where you've got lost, isn't it? You know, you've been out driving, you've taken the wrong turn, you're in an unfamiliar area. Uh, just get me back to the main road, please. I don't want to know how I got here. I don't know, want to know anything about it. I just want the balance of my life to return. Well, let me just tell you a little bit of a story as we try to recover our perspective on these things. Because everybody has a story. And everybody's story really is the one that is most uppermost in our minds. You're thinking about your story now, I dare say. You're thinking about uh, where you've come from, what your journey is, and, and what are the questions that you have in your mind? Questions about things that have brought you where you are. And because you're in the middle of your story, you're maybe not that really that clear about some things. Some things start to make sense and some things still don't make much sense. Let me tell you just a little bit about my own story, just to give you a context of where I'm coming from. I'm a third generation Presbyterian minister. Uh, my father and my grandfather before me were Presbyterian ministers. But my father's story was slightly different because as a pastor, it was a very short-lived experience. After uh, about seven or eight years in his first church, he got involved with a, a woman in the congregation who was 20 years younger than him. He then, uh, through the circumstances of all of that type of problem, he left my mum, he left our family, he left the ministry, and he disappeared out of our lives. We moved away from that area, understandably. My mum took my two sisters and I, and she set up home more or less back where she had come from. I often think that maybe Naomi's story and experience was a little bit like hers. She was uh, going back to the people who had sent her off just a few years ago, having you know, arrived in this place, the wife of the pastor and so forth and the responsibility. And in many ways, back then in the 1950s, it was a great honor and you were held in high esteem. Maybe not like that today. Six years later, she passed away with cancer. She was 42 years old, and my sisters and I, we were, after a series of different attempts by various people to try and sort us out, look after us, care for us, because my parents were only children, so we had no cousins, no uncles, no aunts. Uh, it, it really, there wasn't a solution to that, except that we'd be sent off to boarding school. And I was sent to a boys' school, which was uh, very severe in its regime. It was uh, quite a traumatic experience, and uh, I just had to get on with it. But my mother was a very kind and a gracious and serious and earnest Christian. And it would, to me, it seemed as though she had every reason in life to be miserable. You know, just about everything she had had as a dream had been taken away from her, including when she was in the last stages of her cancer, her own children, looking at us through the window of the hospital, knowing that she was going to leave us. And, you know, I, I'm sure she had many questions. Certainly she passed on to me some anxieties, but she also passed on to me a, a certain sense of hope and faith. For the year before she died, I had come to some sort of a Christian experience. It's hard to know at nine years of age just everything, but I'd come to something of where I think God had certainly stepped into my life in a very profound way. 
But then I move into this world for several years and my life just seems to unravel. And so this idea of trying to figure out the hand of God is very personal because I've had to wrestle with this for many, many years now. I don't think I was very well equipped to handle all of the issues that I was put into, the places where I was. But when I've come throughout the years to understand something of the providence of God, that has, I suppose, it has been the means of rescue of my own life. A sort of a redemption. It's helped me to get stability. And it has really created, I suppose, a sense of desperation. For I come to this subject not because it's a nice theory to look at, but because I desperately need an answer. I really need help to get back to the place where I can survive, not only survive, but where I can function. Because I'm very aware that in every relationship I enter into, I bring my whole baggage of my story with me. And so I know that others would say, well, you know, maybe God would have not been kinder if he'd rewritten the story for you, you know, change things. Well, I don't think that's what God does necessarily. I know he is not the power behind the evil that goes on in my life, but I know that he then steers that, all of those things to fulfill his greater plans. What I want us to do is to take us through a definition, first of all, of the providence of God, because that's what we're thinking about. And I've got one of these definitions that comes from a catechism. It's, a, it's called the Heidelberg Catechism, and maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you're not. But this catechism, is, was written primarily for families to catechize their children. It would have been used on a regular basis each Sunday in the local churches where they would have taken a different question. And I suspect maybe some of you in your churches have been using the same. Question is asked, what do you understand by the providence of God? God's providence is his almighty and ever-present power, whereby, as with his hand, he upholds the heaven and the earth and all creatures and so governs them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, food and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, indeed all things come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. I think it's a, a wonderful uh, statement of the, of the truth that you find in the Bible. And I suppose what providence really is, is providence is looking at everything from God's perspective. Life is really, really confusing whenever we only see things from our own perspective, where we stand in terms of time. That is not with the long view looking down. We can only see where we are, I suppose. And not only with the limits of time, but also with the limits of our capacity and our experience. Because we only bring to our circumstances a certain amount of capacity to think and see and, and understand them. Quite often when somebody else may come into our lives, they can look at things slightly differently and show us another perspective, but even that's not always enough. I mean, that's very clear if you think of Job. Why, whenever Job was looking at his life and everything, everything that had happened to him, you know, from the success moment to the disaster and all that all the unfolding one after another after another. And then he has these friends, they come along and they give him three different perspectives, each of which had a certain amount of truth, but it also had a lot of misunderstanding, which in the end God was able to point out to them. And so it's confusing, but it's also important to notice that our ability to see and understand and make sense of everything is going to always be incomplete. For the scripture says, as the hires are heaven, uh, sorry, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than yours. We read that in Isaiah 55, verse 9. We just can't see everything. We are limited. We don't have omniscience. We have a very limited understanding, even if we think it's fairly large in its own way, but it's still very limited, isn't it? And then thirdly, it would be possible to think that our actions and others' actions upon us are things of little consequence. 
Since God is the big player, we think our part maybe is really not that important. And I was thinking about this, you know, and there is a picture. And sorry, some of my slides might just not be in sync because I'm still trying to get really figured in in this. But this is where we're at, looking at things from God's perspective. But this is the picture. This is the analogy that some of you will identify with. And I gather that in this lockdown period, lots of people have been trying to bake. People who have never baked in their lives before have picked up the, the recipe and they have gone out to get the various items and they've started to bake. So many things go into the bowl, for example. We put in flour and we put in yeast and salt, and water, eggs. Some are sweet and some are sharp. And the process that takes place in the mixing is so crucial, isn't it? That's the way it all blends together. Different things act upon each other in the process. Like, for example, when you bring the sugar alongside the yeast, it helps to facilitate that process that's going to take place there. The raising, the rising agent. In the end, you most certainly arrive with something that's very satisfying. I remember one time with my daughter, we were in one of those phases, you know, where we were trying to, you know, provide healthy things and she was making meringues. And my daughter, one of my daughters, she's just baking as her hobby. And um, so I said to her, do you think if we could try and put less sugar in it, would that be a way of, you know, of uh, maybe making this a healthier option? And of course, Julie, my daughter, listens to her father on this occasion and she says, okay, dad, we'll go less with the sugar. Well, I can remember what they look like. I mean, some of you who are listening to me, you know exactly what they look like. I mean, they didn't, they were just kind of like doughy. They were not pleasant at all. They were miserable. And you see, when I look at that picture, what I see is all of the events in life. And if I'm a baker and I'm not, I've, I did once try to bake a loaf. And I'll admit, I baked a wheaten loaf here. And the first time I did it, it was great. And then the second time I did it, I forgot to put in the baking soda. But the problem then was that I thought in my moment of celebration, I would give, give it away. So I gave it to a friend. Well, if he'd been building a house, that would have been all it was useful for. It was like a brick. It was just like a brick. Because I had not put in one of the elements. The key thing in this analogy is just to remember that there's a bigger process. And sometimes we only see tiny bits of the process. You know, we're in the middle of it, maybe. In fact, we're always in the middle of it, aren't we? I mean, we're never at the end of our story. We're never at the end of our story until we're with the Lord. And there will be sugar moments, and there will be salt moments. There will be times into our lives come different elements to be all part of the process. And in this, it's really important when we, and going back to that point, that providence is looking at everything from God's perspective, it reminds us that, that our life is not really about us. I know that's not always the, the, the message that the world around us is saying, but our life is not about us primarily. Our life is about something that's much bigger than us. There is a point beyond us when all of these things that combine to make up the story of our lives will end up in the result of something really much better, something that God is doing. We are part of God's plans. Those words in the Heidelberg Catechism that remind us that everything that's happening, that's Blade and leaf, rain and drought, fruit and far, fruitful and barren years, all of these things come to us by his fatherly hand with the purpose of something really good. In, I suppose, Romans 8, 28, and the verses around that really sum this up, that everything is working together for good to those that love the Lord. And so our grace and not enabled choices combine with all the other ones. And they all work together in this. And of course, that says to us that there will be benefits in this. And that's, of course, a point to ponder, isn't it? 
knowing this and resting on that fact and that truth really helps us to figure out what what the benefits are on this on this uh, page or on this slide we can see some of those and i quote we can be patient in adversity thankful in prosperity and with a view to the future we can have a firm confidence the heidelberg catechism goes on in the next question to ask the question what is the benefit to know that god has created all things and still upholds them by his providence and this is the answer on the slide that it gives patience in adversity thankfulness and prosperity and we can have a confidence as we look to the future in our faithful god and father we know that no creature shall separate us from his love for all creatures are so completely in his hand that without his will they cannot so much as move one hair of their head and when you apply this you try to understand who is this God behind everything? Who is the one who is behind all of this? Because at the end of the day, it's really important to know who is writing the story. I mean, we know if you've ever watched that famous film, The Wizard of Oz, that as they're all seeking to find the answers to their problems, Mr. Tin Man and, and the lion and the scarecrow, they're looking for different things. And they're behind in behind the wizard is mechanically operating lots of things and so when, whenever you finally meet him he's a bit of a disappointment that's always been my experience in watching the film and i think that's what we're meant to see and it conveys this idea that here's this little man of no great consequence who's controlling everything but we know that the god who is the god behind all of these events in our lives is not someone like that. He is a God who is gracious and wise and loving. Yes, he's all powerful, he's all knowing, he's everywhere. We know all of these big words we use theologically. But we see him primarily in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who comes with a redemptive passion into our world and who in every way is for us. He is for us. God who is wonderful, Before I get to Joseph's story, I just want to do another a couple of things. Pardon me if I slip back and forth a little bit in this. But I want us to think about the powers of explanation when we apply this to our lives. The power of explanation we have, isn't it going to be greatly limited? Because we live in this fallen world, we, when we try to understand God and his ways, when we try to understand the problems in the world that we are facing, our own story and all its brokenness, we have very limited capacity, don't we? But our Christian faith gives us the explanatory power in these painful times. It helps us understand who God is and that he has a greater story going on. This helps us to have a stability because we then know there is a plan. And in the event of some painful situation, situations in our lives, it helps us understand that the pain is necessary even. It also gives us the capacity to have joy, even joy in the midst of our pain. And at the end, it leads to hope. And that's where this all is leading, isn't it? The sense that there is hope in every season of life. Of course, knowing that there is pain is not enough, but knowing that there's a reason for the pain is very, very important. I want to just, we mentioned that this would maybe get some, we might get some insights if we were to look at the life of a person in scripture. In the chapters of Genesis 37, 8, 9, 40, and so forth, there we come across the life of this young man who seems so, uh, so attractive in many ways. And you know his story. I'm not assuming you know everything, but I'm assuming that you know the basic narrative of Joseph from a young life growing up as the, the eye, the apple of his father, his father's eye being taken then sold as a prisoner, a slave into Egypt, taken 
bought by Potiphar, who was the captain of the, the guard in, in the palace. And then, of course, being raised up, lifted up, and then finally put to prison because he was not willing to uh, go along with Potiphar's wife's entreaty. And then in prison, of course, when things begin to take an upward look again, having been elevated to the position of kind of the manager of the prison, nearly under the warden, and then he has the opportunity through these dreams that two, the baker and the cupbearer, have of getting out of the prison. And on that day, chapter 40 of Genesis, whenever he tells the dreams to these two men and, the, and says to them, please don't forget me, but tell my story when you get out there, he is forgotten. And I was thinking about that young man in prison. He's now been 11 years a slave and he will spend two more years in prison, which is roughly about half his life has been so hard. He was about 17 years of age when he was, when he was taken as a prisoner. And, and you wonder to yourself about this young man, how he figures out the events of his life. And as I was thinking about his life, I come up with these five words there on the screen for you. As a way of looking at our lives, understanding that God is behind it. In the end, Joseph comes out with this profound and very important statement. He said, speaking to his brothers as they stand in front of him after all this time, you meant this for bad, but God meant this for good. Going back into the Heidelberg Catechism there, God is working everything, as it says, all things. He is upholding everything in heaven and earth that nothing Leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, food and drink, sickness and health, riches and poverty. Indeed, all things come to us not by chance, but by God's complete intention. So that Joseph has been able, and you're maybe saying, and sometimes people say, oh yes, that was okay for Joseph to say that now that he's, in the, he's now in the position of being the prime minister. Life has turned around. It's like as though he's won the lottery. I mean, you couldn't, you mean, it's brilliant, isn't it? So, uh, I mean, of course he can look back now and say, yes, God meant it for good because he's in a great place. But I think when you begin to see the pattern of his life and the decisions and choices he makes, that it seems as though he's always thinking like that. There is not one hint in his life of resentment. The word that you could use to describe Joseph's life from the moment he is put on that camel's back and it tramps its way all the way to Egypt is service faithfulness. It just seems to be he always responds on every occasion, whether he's put in Potiphar's house or whether he's put in the prison, he starts to serve. He turns to people and serves. And that's why when we think about this, we say, well, he, the backward look, looking backwards all the time full of regret or looking inwards all the time full of self-pity are unhelpful things for us in our lives. When you think about it, if we come to understand that God means things for a good end, that he has a purpose that's something really important, something in his plans that's good, when we look back, we may not understand it. I'm perfectly sure that Joseph could not figure out all of the different dynamics of his life. And when we look inwards, I'm sure he had lots of anger and angst and, and disappointment and confusion. But if you notice the way he lived his life, he began to live always outwardly. He was always looking outwardly. He saw other people. He took an interest in other people. He served other people. And then he was looking upwards, I think. I mean, there is no actual prayer on Joseph's lips recorded in the scripture. Nowhere is there a prayer anywhere where he's saying, Lord, please help me. But everywhere in the passage it says, and the Lord was with him or the Lord gave him favor, or the Lord made him successful. And when we find him in Genesis chapter 40, these two men have told their dreams to him, the cupbearer and the baker. And I think if Joseph had totally been, as it were, disillusioned with these things and with all that God had done in his life, he would have said, I don't think I would bother with dreams if I was you, because I once had a dream. 
In fact, I had a couple of dreams, and in those dreams I saw, this is what I saw, about, and he could tell them that the dreams he had about his sheaf was the one that stood up, and all the other ones bowed before it, or he was the one in the sky that everything, the stars and the heaven all directed towards him. And he would say, don't waste your time in dreams. But he doesn't. He says, God is the one who is the revealer of dreams. Tell me your dreams and I'll tell you what they mean. And, and I think in that moment, we get such an insight into this young man. He's now 28 years of age. And, and we see in him a man, I believe, who all the time was looking upwards. Not to his dreams, but to the one who behind the dreams had revealed to him something of what the purpose and plan of his life was. And when you and I think of God as the God who designs and purposes the details of our lives, we say to ourselves, well, if God is purposing for my life good, then that is the, that is the thing that should shape the way I look at that thing so that I should be able to get to the place where I'm in standing alongside him. And I look at my life and I say, I cannot understand this. But the, the, the end result of this is good. And that will have the effect of doing exactly what that statement said, that we can be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and have a firm confidence about the future. So he's looking upwards, I think. And then, of course, you remember that life is always onwards. <laughs> you know, Joseph had the dream. And I believe the dream was God's way of revealing his will to him. God has given his dream to you and I in the scriptures. It's a big dream. It ends up in the most marvelous of places. But it may go through some very dark valleys. In fact, it, on, it, it, it without question will go through some very dark valleys. And I have no doubts that maybe it already has. And maybe you're in a dark valley right now. I know that in my life, there were many dark valleys that at the time I couldn't understand. I mean, I, if you had met me at 19 years of age, some would say I was a very balanced young man. <laughs> I had a chip in both shoulders, if you know what that means. I was pretty resentful. And of course, I couldn't understand. I try to understand I mean, I hadn't done anything exceptionally wrong. Why was I having to pay the price for other people's wrongs? And yet, you know, it's now after all these years that I am able to look back and say, thank you for those things. I think it's really such a key thing to be able to know that my story, it's more about God changing me and my story than God changing my story. I think I can and have been changed by this, and I accept the things that are going on even now a lot easier. I, I think I'm able to pray better. I may be more empathetic towards other people. But let me tell you something, because in all of this, when I think about the when I think about the, the fact that the details, the blades of grass, the hairs of our head, the strength of the wind, the current of the water, all of these things are all part of the story. In 1996, I was asked if I would lead a group of young people to, on, a, on a summer team to the Czech Republic. I thought it would be an interesting thing to do, and I did it, and I, and I ended up doing it for, for a number of years. But on one occasion, I was asked to go back to meet some of the church leaders in, in Prague, and I went to their headquarters there in Young Manova Street at the bottom of Venslice Square and up around... Um, and we sat down together in this room. There were about four or five of us. And there was an elderly man came into the room and he took out his, his notebook. And this elderly man, elderly man writes my name. I tell him my name and he says, oh, I know somebody of that name. This man was in his 70s. And he, uh, I asked him, was that in the Czech Republic? He said, no, no. He said, um, it was 1947 just about 50 years earlier, he said, I went to study in Northern Ireland and I lived in a room with a man of that name. And I said, 
all right, I said, and tell me about him. And he told me a little bit about this man and he told me a little bit about his background. And I said, you know, that was my father. And then he asked me, oh, and how is your father? And of course, I hadn't seen my father in my life now. And I said to him, well, I was 40 years of age at that time. And I just said, well, I think he's okay and so forth. He gave me a book that he had written and he said, would you take this back and give it to him and tell him I was asking for him? And I said, of course I will. I put the book in my bag. I came home with that. And I started to ponder and think about the, the whole, you know, the circumstances that here I am. I'm one, this man is one out of 10 million people. And he and I find ourselves in a room together just about 50 years from the last time he met my father. I'm maybe one out of 400 pastors in my denomination who has volunteered or been asked to do this. And when you start to multiply and compute all of the details around that, and you put those two people in the room together, and you, and you try to connect all those things together, you say, this is really strange, isn't it? There is a, there is, there's a hand of something greater than any of us here in this story. Well, I haven't, the whole, I haven't time to go into the whole detail, but I took, the book eventually went to my father and we met and we got to know each other after that. That was when I was over 40 years of age. That's a story. And we had 20 years of contact twice a year, roughly, for he lived in Scotland and I went to visit him back and forwards until he passed away two years ago. But as I was thinking about that story, I was thinking about this whole idea of providence in all of the tiny details that were woven together to bring that about in order that God would do something good. He did something good in my father's life and in his family's life and in my life as a consequence of that. But when I look at these things and go back down the road of life and try to figure out the hope that there is an understanding of the providence of God, it's really helped me to have that, those things, to have confidence as I look back when things are hard. It gives me joy in my heart when things are good, and it gives me a sense of peacefulness in every situation and learning so far. I have to relearn it again and again. I need to speak it to myself constantly. But it has helped me to pray for other people better. And, and it means that I pray for people. And these are the things I pray. I'm not sure if I've written them down. No, I'll come back to Venith in a minute. We pray to develop a simple trust in God in every situation. That our trust will be an automatic response. That we, it will be our first kind of natural response to what happens. It will not be a disaster, but we'll first say, God must be in this. And then we can pray that God may show us how to negotiate that. He does say that there is no testing, that he doesn't give us a way of escape. And, and I believe that God gave Joseph gifts and abilities. He was able to go outward. He was able to look upward and he was able to keep, a, he had a sort of a constant sense of what might be. That dream did not leave him. God puts hope in our hearts. And I pray that God will give people hope so that they'll not uh, become totally lost in the middle of a painful situation. And then I pray that all the other resources of God in his word among his people, and I think that's very important, God in his word among his people, do not elude us lest we forget that we are not alone. Because that's one of the hardest things. I mean, Joseph, I think, must have felt very alone. He was a, in a foreign culture, and he was in a category of persons that were like persona non grata. It must have been extremely hard for him. And then as we think about how to assist other people, I've got three simple things. I, I put it this way. We don't try to fix them. When somebody comes to me with their difficult story, my job is not to fix them. My job is to listen quietly to them and then to walk alongside them quietly, praying for them to discover life from God's perspective. Th this very truth, that if they can understand this truth, then it can start to shape the way they think about their life. And that's what really needs to happen. I have put down uh, Venita 
Rendell Reisner, 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 this is a book which I would recommend to you. Uh, Vinita, as a young person, suffered with uh, a, a problem with her legs, polio, and uh, she had 13 operations. And then she got married and then she lost a child. And the child died and then her marriage ended and she had all sorts of troubles. And her life was really one series of problems after another. But Vinita looks at those troubles in life and that's how she describes them as gifts that are wrapped in black but gifts nonetheless she makes a reference in her book in that book you'll find it if you if you get the hold of it but i i, I note it there at page 112 when she quotes johnny erickson tada and says most of us are able to thank god for his grace and comfort but we don't thank him for the problem now i don't think she came to that position in a day or two. I remember reading way back in 1977 her own biography, The First Little Story. And then since I've got to know Steve Estes very, very well, the close her, the young pastor who sat beside her bed during those days. And of course, at that time, if you would have asked her, you know, is this a good thing? She would have said, possibly no, this is a terrible thing. And she didn't want to live. But she has finally, throughout the years, by the grace of God, come to the place where she gets his perspective and sits with him on this. And she helps so many of us, doesn't she? When she's able now not just to thank him for his grace and comfort, but actually thank him for, not just in it, but for the problem. I just find that so, <clears throat> so, so incredibly challenging. And the hope is that our story is not going to be changed but that we will gain a truer picture as we embrace this truth. And then we can accept our situation. And when we've learned by the grace of God to accept it, then we will be changed. I mentioned about how to fix, not to fix people. I mentioned here about how to assist people. You maybe want to ask a question about that. But I put this little comment of John Piper's up here that I find really, really helpful when I was wrestling with things. What is grace? It is not grace to bar what is not bliss, nor flight from all distress, but this, the grace that orders our trouble and pain, and then in the darkness is there to sustain. You see, your story, my story, is never devoid of grace. Never. We would not even be alive without grace. There is common grace for all humanity, and then the believer has saving grace on top of that. And you know, God's grace is with us in every situation. Sometimes we're just not aware of it. And we need to pray that we would sense it and see it and have help of others in order to embrace it.